voices rise, all creation cries, singing out in endless hallelujah. From this moment on, join with heaven's song, singing out in endless hallelujah. Last week's message, God has been literally tracking us each and every week. The Spirit of God continues like little breadcrumbs. He drops. He's leading me and us um, together down a path of what He wants to impart with us knowledge-wise. As you know, we ended up in Genesis. because it, I love Genesis because it talks about the order of things. And what I want to show you here, remember we talked about the tree of life. There was two trees not placed in a hidden place, but placed directly in the middle of the garden for purpose. Because God knew us. He created us. He knew that there would be that the devil would come in and he was going to use the devil because it's free choice. Are we going to be obedient? Are we going to eat of the tree of life? Or are we going to eat of the tree of death? And as you know, there was a fall there. And uh, there was, of course, the, the devil had deceived Eve and, uh, and But most importantly, think about what would have happened if Adam would have said, uh, uh-uh-uh, I'm not going to do that because of what God said that we would surely die. We need to listen and honor Him. I want just wonder, I can't help but chew on this a little bit, I just wonder what would have happened if he would have said no. Because you have to understand that he had placed Eve under his care. And if you go and look closely in the, in the Scripture, God literally gave, when He picked up, He put man in the eastern part of Eden, in the garden, He literally had told him, do not eat of these two trees. He had given him the mandate. Then out of man was pulled woman as his helper. And He had named everything, including the woman. And the woman was under His care as well. And... She obviously had gotten that message relayed either by Adam or also God because that's what she said to this thing. Well, we can't eat of this fruit because it says in that day that we do, we'll surely die. But then what does the, the devil do? He gives you a half-truth. And that's how the whole thing happened. But it was the curse that was given to Eve was because of her deception. But the curse for Adam was different because he literally disobeyed God um, directly. And there was no deception there. Um, what I love about this, what this is where we're tracking um, and where we're going is from this key verse here. And at the end here you'll see that God had placed an angel um, with a flaming sword that turned every direction to guard the way back to the tree of life. You know, Adam, it would have been natural for him to say, oh, we're, you know, I've got this curse well, let me go to the tree of life where I can then be healed. Well, God put an angel there because, no, you're going to die, just like he promised. But this whole situation was to basically open our eyes, open mankind's eyes to the fact that we needed healing. And Jesus, being part of the three at the, at the creation, right there in the, in the creation process, he knew that he was going to be on a tree. And if you read in Revelation, you know that there's a tree of life in between the main street and the throne. And on that tree is 12 fruits, one for every month. And the tree of life also still has the angel, but the angel's not guarding it with, with a sword any longer. But it's there at the throne. And it's fr uh, when we get to, to the throne, we will freely be able to eat from that. And we will never die. And we'll be able to um, live. But I love this here, to guard the way. The way. If anybody's watched The Mandalorian, or probably very little if anybody in this congregation, 
they, I find it interesting because in, in that, the guy goes, but this is the way. But this is the way. And, um, but I find this interesting in Genesis. This is the first time that we see the way to the tree of life. We're going to go into Scripture here in a little minute. Remember, um, Jesus is the only way, right? Amen. And Jesus is the tree that's represented. He was the sacrifice that gives us access then again to the tree. Thank God for it. So today's message is titled, The Way to Our Jewish King and Groom. Now, if we want to understand where we're tracking, where things are going to, how things, how revelation happens, we've got to understand, we've got to go back to the basics and realize, okay, it's a, we're, it's a Jewish king. Jesus literally was a Jewish king, and so the things that he spoke to back in the day was relative to the Jewish people. Well, it was for meaning and purpose. And um, by the way, what's interesting, I mean, this is kind of a side note, the graphics over here, I have a program that I had purchased to allow me to do, this is um, AI technology, so I literally was able to plug in and tell it what I wanted created, and that's what you're looking at. Isn't that kind of crazy? Yeah. Pretty cool, huh? So anyways, um, so the way, the truth, and life, if you've got your word, the sword this morning, which we encourage everyone to bring a Bible, if you've got it, turn to John 14, 1 through 6, we're going to start there. And what this is, is this ties into that verse in, in Genesis where it says he's the way, you know, uh, to eternal life. And here we are. This is Jesus in the flesh that, that is of spirit and of flesh. And so when we end up in heaven one day, praising God with the masses, millions and millions and millions, if, if not billions, I mean, it's going to be a massive amount of people. Literally, when we look at him, we're going to see a human face, and we're going to really relate to our king because he is flesh and he is spirit, just like what we are. So it says this, if you will, look at John 14, verse 4, I'm sorry, verse 1. It says this, comforting words from our king. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, also, or believe also in me. Now, you have to understand, he's talking to the Jews, Jewish people at that time, who were really steeped in. They, you know, of course, understood Moses' law that was given, the temple that was erected, you know, that, that uh, King Solomon had built. And they understood what sacrifice was. Something had to die on behalf of their sins. And they understood who God was. And there were several names for God. Um, Adonai was one of them. Um, the God of, of Abraham, um, Isaac, and Jacob. They understood the God of their forefathers, the living God. So Jesus is saying, if you, if you believe in God, believe also in me. Because he's, he's explaining to them that he is the Son of God. So it says, in my Father's house. That's what implies that he's the Son. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so... I would have told you. What does that mean? That means he is a man of his word. He, he, he is a truth. He speaks truth. So it says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. Now, this is a hint. You'd have to be Jewish to under, start picking up what he's laying down. You see, it was Jewish tradition for the, uh, the, the groom to have an engagement period. And he would then leave and go and prepare a place for his, for his bride. And so he's laying these elements down. And so we start understanding the kind of love that he has for us, we as his bride. He is promising, he has gone away, which you know he did, he ascended, and then he's going to come back, it says, and he's going to come and take his bride. And uh, this is a promise that he's given to us. I've got a message that is coming. I'm going to give you a little sneak peek of something that I just learned on this past week. And my mind was like... Baptism. 
Does anybody know why we're baptized? Oh, is it because Jesus said so and he was the, uh, the example? Well, that's part of it. Yeah, that's true. We know what it symbolizes, purification proce process where you're, you're the old man becoming the new, clean, purification. You're purified. When we, in fact, in Revelation it says white linen. That means we're, we're, we're washed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? You've heard that? Well, here again, you have to look at Jewish, our Jewish king to understand in Jewish tradition, they literally would end up, um, the, the groom would be washed in water, um, immersed in water, and the bride would do, would do also the same thing. It was symbolic before the wedding. Before the wedding. And they then would be able to come together and they'll be purified, purified one beautiful and that's the whole purpose remember when Jesus was being baptized and uh, John was like I'm not worthy you know what I'm saying I'm not worthy and he says but you have he says if you just if you understand if we're going we're going to go into depth this is a beautiful thing it is so so awesome when you really understand that we are serving a Jewish king the examples that he gives throughout the new testament then just is like a light bulb it just goes Oh my goodness, it's all making sense. Mm -hmm. And from this information, you're also going to be able to gather, okay, when is he going to come? Because he says he prepares a way. Well, when will it be? Well, the clues are given. But we don't know the day or the hour, but we will know the season, it does say in the, in the Word of God. So we're going to be diving into some really awesome, I mean, man, it, he just keeps bringing it. And so I'm just, I'm trying to keep up and uh, keep my mind open. So anyways, here, if you track on, it says, He goes to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you to myself. That's a rapture moment, by the way. That's a collection, a gathering of his, of his uh, bride. That where I am, if he's not here on earth, we're not going to be there. If he's in heaven, that's where we're going to be. It says, where I am, there you may be also. We're going to be with him. That's what's very key when you're reading, especially Revelation 19. That's up for another another day. And where I go, no, and the what does it say? The way. The way. You know. The way. You need to you need to get thinking about this. The way. The way. He is the light and lamp for our feet, so we may know the way, the path. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Remember the big house, Father's house, and there's the gate? you got to go through the gate, and he is the door. And he is the way. This is where and all you the can't. religions will say you can, you can worship yeah. all these gods to get to God. And this is the scripture. The religions of the world today will say, oh, you know, these false religions we were just talking about. All of them are spokes on a wheel and they go to a hub and God's the hub. And they're just all worshiping the same God. And that's a big road there. Oh, yeah, it is. And you, that is a lie from the enemy. And the enemy really wants people to think that, that... Anyways, um, but Jesus says that I'm the way. And I find this interesting. We were created to worship God Almighty. We have already in our DNA, the perfect DNA that God put placed within us um, is to worship. So why would you, I mean, and I've even told other people who are looking at all the religions of the world. I've actually had conversations even within three weeks ago with an individual I'm like well we can agree we are created for worship and this individual was like yes but he says but but look at all these religions which one and he's we're having dialogue and I'm like listen the only religion is a dead religion it's all about relationship with a living God and Jesus is the only one that offers love and everybody understands what love is and the benefits of love, and everyone's drawn and attracted to that. And um, 
You can go, and I was you can like, go to church every day of the week. And you can spend all day in church and that'll make you saved. That's that's correct. Yeah. yeah. You gotta accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and yeah. confess his name. That's as it. King. That's it. One true God. Yeah. Praise God. Yes. And the thing is, is we also ask for forgiveness each day we take our trash out out of our temple. And that's how we keep ourselves clean before him. And we read the word of God and put on the full armor of God. And uh, but anyways, so Thomas is asking, how do we know the way? Well, it's it's keep your eyes on Jesus all times. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he's the only way. And that's that's what I shared with that gentleman there. I'm like, listen, um, if you understand that you were created for worship, don't worship something dead. Worship the living God. And you're only going to find the living God. You can't go to heaven unless you go through that of Jesus. So, in your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Exodus 12. This is where the Spirit of God was taking me in, in on this on this uh, quest of of what exactly is God's trying to show us here, and what does it mean by that He's the way? Well, in Exodus 12, uh, and while you're flipping there, I'm going to go ahead and tell you this is where the Passover was instituted. This is where Moses was given the instruction. It's a look back and a period of thanksgiving of, of the Passover that happened. If you remember, just like in the future to come with the, tribu- with the, with the great tribulation, there's going to be lots of plagues to cause even Israel who won't bend a knee to the living God. The plagues will certainly bring, when you bring on the pain, you're going to be like, oh, I'm going to bend a knee or either I'm going to be... I'm going to turn my back on God. And unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of people that still will um, and, and won't be obedient. But here, e- Egypt was the demonic land, and we went through, I guess it was almost a year ago, that we went through all the plagues, and every one of those plagues were, when they prayed their way out of this plague that was they were facing, they literally were, were praying to a demonic God that was not living. That had no real power, and uh, but the last plague. Remember what happens is the firstborn was was destined to die. Think about it. It was a male that was destined to die, and so it was the firstborn too, which is kind of interesting. And to, for the Hebrews, you know, God offered a covering for the Hebrews through all, but I think it was. They went through the first three plagues only because they were serving false gods. But once they got that straightened out and they got the, and God got their attention, once they went through the three plagues like all the Egyptians, then they were exempt from, from the fourth plague on all the way to the tenth one. Well, the tenth one was the worst one, which is the firstborn would die. But God had mandated, if you will simply do this in faith... And that's what we do when we ask God in our heart and life, is if you take the blood of a lamb and you mark your door, whoo, your door, your mind and your heart, mark it with the blood, and then the spirit of death would come over and he would not touch this house because this house had the authority of the blood. Okay? And they were saved. So it says this. This is the Passover. Uh, it's a feast, a Jewish feast, a time of celebration of when God came through on behalf of his people. And an offering. he offered a deliverance for them. So it says this in verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month, <coughs> this is really interesting. Yeah. This month, shall be your beginning of months. In other words, it won't be January through December, but it's going to be this particular month that you're going to start out your year at this time frame. This month shall be your beginning of your months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor come together next to his house. Take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need. 
you shall make your count for the lamb. Now this is what's real key. This is Jesus. This is a description. That's why he's called the, the lamb to take away the sins of the world. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Jesus, there was no sin within him. He was able to, 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 to not um, give in in that way because he is God. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Have you ever seen a, uh, you know, a, a um, puppies or even kittens and you get to see all the different ones and there's always one that's like, oh man, that's a perfect one. That's the one. That's the it. Well, this is what you would do with little old lambs. Lambs are just, when you see a picture of a lamb, and listen, I'm, I'm not that way usually with a lot, but if you look at a baby lamb, it is something about a baby lamb in particular, it's just like, oh man. You, you would not want in anything to hurt it. You know what I'm saying? Um, it says, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it. Now this is a very interesting and vital. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. So look at that. From the 10th to the 14th. Now why is that? Well, I'll tell you. We'll fall in love with it. Yes, that's right. And you can't stand what's going to happen. Right. That's right. Because you have literally connected with that, that little cute lamb and that you have been feeding and taking care of and just loving on for that period of time. And it's perfect. It's beautiful. And you would protect it from you know a dog or a wolf or anything else that would try to kill it. But what are they commanded to do? Kill it on behalf of sin. Something precious, that precious be killed on their behalf. It says, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it. What time? Kill it. At twilight. I find that very interesting. Twilight. Why would it say twilight? I'll tell you what. I, I, this is not, I'm not saying the Spirit of God gave this to me. This is something that's just a thought for me, Joseph. Okay? But I'm thinking twilight. God's always a God of order, and there's a reason why he put twilight I don't know, but maybe he might come back during that time. He is the blood. He's the sacrifice. I don't know. But I just know that he was born in twilight hours. I do know that much. He came into the world during that time frame. But I always take notes when I see little clues. It's about the time they were preparing Jesus' body for the grave mm -hmm. also. So That's a good insight, too. being prepared for the grave just like the lamb was dying, being prepared to be the sacrifice. Oh, that's good. Well, that... that that sounds really good. Yeah, to get him down before the Sabbath. Yeah, that's right. Before the before the next day. Yeah, before right there. The evening of that day. Yeah. All right. So it says, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorpost, and on the lintel of the houses where they eat. Now this is very interesting. I have highlighted where they eat. Do you know where you eat? Is where your heart is. You know, it's your space. It's your place. And this is your house. And it's and saying that you've got to put his precious blood above your door, over your mind and your heart. And it says this, Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in the fire. Now we're going to, we're going to take the Lord's Supper... What do we do? We eat of his flesh, right? His flesh was broken on our behalf. We know, we know the symbolism there. The Lord's Supper. And um, roasted in the fire with unleavened bread and with the bitter herbs, they shall eat of it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire. Now all this is symbolic. When we go through the Seder, Remember, they had the bitter herbs. All this had its, its reasons and purposes. And, um, but I find this very interesting because here you get to see the correlation where Jesus was the, was the lamb that took away the sin of the world. He was sacrificed. And here, during this process of a feast given, it's a look back. And in this case, it had not happened yet. It was the connection that God Almighty was laying out for the mankind to understand. There is a Savior to come. And Moses was given this instruction to follow. 
And it's just a beautiful story of the love story that he has for mankind. Um, so it says, now before the feast of the Passover, this is in John 13, by the way. I came across this and I was like, oh, this is interesting because we're just talking about, we were just talking about the instructions of the Passover. Well, here it says, now before the feast of the Passover, remember the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper? When Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. He knew at the end of his physical life was about ready to happen. And the Lord's Supper, the supper being ended, this is interesting, I got it highlighted here, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. All right, let's think about the way. This is an opportunity that Judas the Iscariot had. You know, he had a love for money. He was one of the 12 disciples. He was given free will and choice to choose Jesus as, as Lord. But here it says that he denied him. And that door was finally shut for him. In other words, the door was shut. It was never opened to him. And here he, he is, to, he's decided at this point in time on Passover to betray Jesus. And I find this very remarkable because of the fact of the time that it happened, which is the Feast of, Tabern or the feast of uh, Passover. So Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God, was going to God. The doorway which Jesus is always standing outside of, of a lost person's heart. He politely, softly knocks. And we have the option to open that door and allow that spirit in. If you're a, if you're a demon worshiper today, you have opened your heart to the wrong spirit. And that spirit has come into their door. Um, and it's no different with the Holy Spirit, except he's polite about it. He just knocks softly. Knocking. That's interesting. Great segue there. Matthew 7, chapter 7, verse 7 and 8 says this. Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. Do you notice it says, ask, seek, and knock. Do you know why a lot of Christians today suffer and they don't have what they need? Because they're knocking first. We're not asking. Not asking. Yeah. What is this? Take the first letter of ask, seek, and knock. What does it spell? Ask. It says ask. We don't ask. If you don't ask, you don't receive, right? That's a good point, isn't it? So it says this in verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Reference to a door. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Thank you, Jesus. What does John 10 say? Jesus' words here. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, there's the gate, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. You know what pasture means for sheep? Heaven. Somebody that feeds us, takes care of us. Green, it means prosperity. All those good things. But it says the thief comes. Uh-oh. Dum, dum, dum. Who's the thief? Satan. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life not just eternal life, y'all. Not just green pastures where you get fed, but to have life more abundantly. You know, here in the physical world, Jesus, by Jesus' stripes, you are healed. You have abundant life here in this, in this physical world. My life is better because I know Jesus. And I've never met someone who's asked Jesus in their heart and life where they regretted it. They're like, man, that was the worst thing I ever did. I've never met anybody. Not to date. But I've heard story after story after story of how God has freed people up, have, how God has 
giving you the medicine for the right price when you need it, right? Yes. Amen. Um, that's the good God we serve. All right, we're starting to, to um, get toward the end of my message this morning. We have not yet. We're getting ready. I'm telling you, I keep saying it. It's keep coming. Trust me. God's given me the breadcrumbs, and I'm just following, but we are getting closer and closer to this revelation, and we're going to go into the, the seven churches. But I really, my mind was blown this week when I looked at this, and God led me into this scripture, and I was like, wow, here we go. We got the tree of life. Or the tree of death. We have the tree of life of the faithful church. Or we have a tree of death, which is the lukewarm church, y'all. Now, you're like, well, prove it to me. Well, I'm going to show you the differences right here. Look here. Look what, what is said about the faithful church. It says that, that God, the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. They, it says, I know your works, church. See, I have set before you an open door. The door's opened. That means belief in Christ Jesus happened. And, and it's not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. People that actually put it in action. Because he knows the works, and he's writing them down, and he sees that this is a good, faithful, and obedient servant of Christ Jesus. Therefore, the door is wide open to the kingdom. And no one can shut it. The devil's lies. Oh, you're not worthy. You, you can't do that. Oh, no, that's just a lie from the enemy. But no one can shut it. For you have a little strength. Wonder why it's little. You just need a little, right? A little strength. But here's what's most important. Have kept my word. Should there be, you know, we can go on and on and on about the culture of the day that have crept into our churches. I don't need to list them. You know them. Does it really say that? But it looks so good to be this or that. Or it feels good if it's this or that. Or, oh, that's not really that important. Well, no, listen. It says the faithful church, all these good things have happened because they have kept my word. There's the instruction. You wanna, I want to be here. The remnant church. I want to be the faithful ones in the last days. What does it say about the lukewarm church? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Do you know why he's standing there at the door and he's knocking? Because the lukewarm church has not opened their, their door. The door hasn't been opened. I was like, I literally had a oh my goodness moment. Because I had always thought, well, the lukewarm church. Now, there are individuals in the lukewarm church. Not all of them are destined to hell. I'm not saying that at all because you'll see it in the verse. It literally spells it out. It says this is for everybody. This is anybody. But if anybody hears my voice, sheep, you got to know it's got to be a voice from the sheep, right? I mean, the voice of the shepherd is, is the one you listen to, not the devil's counterfeit voice because it does exist in the world today. But if anyone hears my voice and opens your heart's door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. So... In this day, I don't want to be a I don't want to be a lukewarm church where many of our church goers today have not even yet opened their heart's door. I want to be known as the faithful church. That's what I want to be. And you can be, even in the last days, even during the lukewarm church age, which many pastors will talk about, you don't have to be that. I'm not going to be that. So you shouldn't be that either. Um, anyways. I just love that. I, I'm just awakened to this uh, this whole thing. We're going to end up talking about the seven churches, and we'll be in more details. And all of it isn't just for the the, the uh, day of 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 when uh, John was on the island. It's it was all about prophecy and about how the churches would roll out, and the, also the churches that exist today. There is a faithful church today, and there certainly is a lukewarm one that we know about. So I want to end this with this. You know, this was a the way to our Jewish king and groom. I'll tell you what the way is. It's Jesus. And Jesus stands on at our heart's door and he knocks. Have you opened your heart to him today? Everybody in this room I know 
personally on this day. And from what I've heard from those who confess off their mouth that they are believers in Christ Jesus, then that door's been opened. But if you don't know, or you know somebody, that you meet someone this week, you ask God for the assignments this week, He'll put you in path. If you ask, remember, ask, seek, and knock. If you ask for the assignments, he will, it will come up in the most, it's just a God thing. And you'll recognize it, and the Holy Spirit will be involved with it, and all you're there to do is to sh show them a little bit of love, lift the name of Jesus up, and you're throwing seed out. And then you walk away because it's not your job to grow it. It's the Holy Spirit's job. And you just let, let Him do it. And that's how He does it. And that's how it's harvested. Woo! The lukewarm church is, to me is just kind of coming to my mind is that just like the, they may as well just be a bunch of liars at that point. No one likes a spouse that um, is not 100% sold out to, to their husband. And Jesus is no different. He is a jealous God. Remember we talked not long ago where in James it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. He's a jealous God. He doesn't want any, he doesn't want the counterfeit voice to be in the temple. You can't have the counterfeit voice in the temple. You got to rebuke the enemy and tell him to get the hell out of there. It, the only, there's only one master in the house. A house divided will fall. So we give our allegiance to. Did you make him Lord today? Was he truly Lord of everything in your life? Is Lord the very, but, but my spouse and my family, or but, but my church is even before that, or is the culture even above what God says in His Word. No. My good and faithful servant, those are reserved for those that have literally kept His Word, as the faithful church says. Those who have kept my Word and have not denied my name. Don't. When it says confess with your mouth, you do that in a prayer when you ask Him to come in, but it's more than that. It's you confessing over your lifetime who is King and Lord of life. Who is your king? Is he a Jewish king? Which king? Not the counterfeit religions of the world, but on, the only way into the kingdom. Amen. Our voices rise, all creation cries.